One of the very important activities as part of the risk management of medical devices is evaluation of residual risks. Residual risk is the amount of risk left over after you have implemented all your risk controls. And it's important because you have to evaluate the leftover risks to make benefit risk decisions. It's also important to disclose them to your users and patients and regulatory authorities. But how much to disclose? How to disclose? What to disclose? What are the requirements versus what's nice to have? There are a lot of questions and many times there's a lot of confusion around that. Hello everyone, I'm Naveen Agarwal and I want to welcome you to my weekly video update. Now this question came up in one of our recent interactive Q&A sessions. If you're not familiar with those, it is just a very informal forum for us colleagues from the medical device industry to get together and talk about common issues, questions, concerns, confusions. And it's very casual and informal. So if you are interested, you can join us. We do it every month. Keep an eye on my LinkedIn feed and you will see an announcement coming up soon. And if you cannot join us, you can look up the recordings of past Q&As on my YouTube channel. So therefore, subscribe to this channel and turn those notifications on. Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about this question around disclosure of residual risks. What is required? Let's say by EUMDR, which is now going to be effective very soon. What is required about residual risk disclosure from an ISO 14971 point of view? That's the 2019 revision of the risk management standard for medical devices. So you might be asking yourself, is there a difference between the two requirements? which one you should follow and how you should implement it. So we will talk about some of those details in this video. Then we will also talk about still where the uncertainties are and how you might want to manage these sometimes different competing requirements. So we'll have a discussion around this, but there are still many more topics or questions related to this topic that need to be discussed. So make sure you leave a comment or engage with me in a discussion on LinkedIn. So let's look into this. Okay, so as far as the residual risk disclosure requirement for ISO 14971 are concerned, here, here they are. So in clause eight, there's a requirement for evaluation of overall residual risk. The overall residual risk is the aggregate, sum total of all residual risks. The manufacturer shall inform users of significant residual risks and shall include the necessary information in the accompanying documentation in order to disclose those residual risks. Now you might ask the question, now this underlying emphasis is mine, it's not on the standard. What is significant? Well, standard doesn't tell you what is significant, but they leave you some clues. Significant is how you define them as significant. So I wanna discuss some of those clues in the remaining points. In Annex A, A2.8, However, it is the manufacturer's decision as to what and how much information should be provided regarding these significant residual risks. So it's up to you. So let's look at the ISO TR 24971, which really provides more guidance, more clarification. In Annex D, D.3, the decisions of the manufacturer regarding the disclosure of the residual, residual risks are recorded in the risk management file. So you should document your decisions. So let's Take a look at why we should do it. What is the intent behind this disclosure requirement? In the same annex of the ISO TR 24971, they tell you, within the framework of the intended use, the user can decide in which clinical setting the device can be used to achieve a certain benefit for the patient. So it could be patient specific. You want the disclosure to help the decision to be made for a specific patient in a specific clinical setting. That's one of the purposes. The second intent is that it can also be useful for the user or the hospital organization to prepare the patient for possible side effects or harms that can occur during or after. So we want to inform them and prepare them. That's another intention. Most importantly, look at this. In Annex C, C.4, consider practicability in the context of benefit risk communicating too many residual risks so that the user has difficulty understanding which ones are 
really important is not a good thing. So you should not be communicating everything. Imagine trying to fly a plane where the dashboard is so complex, you cannot understand the signals you are getting and take the right action at the right time. So you have to be judicious and smart about what you disclose and how you disclose. That's what the ISO is telling you. Okay, so now let's look at what EUMDR, which is a regulation, which is a law, what they require. So in article, article 32H, summary of safety and clinical performance implantable devices, there is a requirement there, information on any residual risks and any undesirable effects, warning and precautions, any not just significant they want any annex 1 chapter 1 item 4 this is the general safety and performance requirements manage risks so that the residual risk associated with each hazard as well as the overall residual risk is just acceptable and they say as far as possible without adversely affecting benefit risk and inform users of any residual risk not just the significant residual risk but any same Annex 1 Chapter 3, additional requirements related to information supplied with the devices, label and the IFU. Residual risks which are required to be communicated to be included as limitations, contraindications, precautions or warnings. They are telling you how to do it. And I think depending upon the severity of the consequence of those residual risks, you can organize the communication as limitations, contraindications, precautions or warnings so that it can be more organized and more, more informative and more actionable. So they're telling you how to do it. Then further in uh, Annex 14, Clinical Evaluation and PMCF. PMCF is Post-Market Clinical Follow-up. Clinical Evaluation Plan to include specifications of methods to be used for safety with reference to the determination of residual risks and side effects. So they are requiring that as well. So as you can see, there are a lot of differences as far as EUMDR and ISO 14971 are concerned. ISO 14971 leaves you a lot of leeway, decision making and prioritization and how you want to communicate. You just need to document your decision and rationale. EUMDR requires any residual risks to be disclosed appropriately and they're telling you how. So there's a little bit of a a, a, a difference could be quite significant and how you do it. Interestingly enough, one interesting idea came up in our conversation where just like the advertisements you see, the main risks are highlighted in the content and all other risks which are potentially not significant are listed for the purpose of regulatory compliance in a big disclaimer. So it is there for anybody to see it, but it is not emphasized. So how you emphasize is up to you, how you organize is up to you, but you need to meet the intent of both EUMDR requirements and the recommendations of ISO 14971 to show your compliance to that standard. And it is not trivial. It will require you to potentially have a good conversation with your medical and clinical folks as well as your users and patients maybe usability studies is one way to test it out what works what doesn't work because you also want to be effective in your disclosure and your risk management process overall now one concern remains is that even though iso 14971 has been recognized by the eu it has not been harmonized for regulatory purposes and there is a considerable amount of uncertainty about the level of harmonization and the timing of that harmonization. So there's a lot happening in that space. And as more, become, more updates become available, I will bring them to you so that you stay informed. But for now, my recommendation would be to give it some serious thought and consideration. Examine your current practices. Be mindful of what your users and patients expect and how they make decisions. But at the same time, be aware of the regulatory requirements. Not an easy task by any means, but I hope you will find a way to accomplish both of these goals. As always, I want to hear from you. If you have any comments, suggestions, questions, best practices to share, please do leave a comment or engage with me on LinkedIn and continue to have a dialogue over there. 
I really look forward to hearing from you and I hope all of you are staying safe in these very difficult circumstances.